Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Dauphiny. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And our presenter today is our genealogy librarian, Regina Fitzpatrick, who is going to close out our National Family History Month programming today, um, just sharing some experience she had when she was doing her own genealogical and historical research, how newspapers save the day and what a really great resource uh, newspapers can be. Um, I'd also like to point out that uh, while we are closing out our, our video portion of National Family History Month, um, just want to highlight some of the, the things that we've done at the library this past month. Um, we did have two previous programs uh, in the month. Uh, first was Martin Fisher's Write It, and he discussed how to uh, write um, kind of family histories and the whole writing process. And we also had a cemetery panel discussion with cemeteries throughout New Jersey, um, who kind of talked about the the efforts that they're undertaking, um, some of the initiatives, their role in the you know the context of genealogy, um, and how they they play a part in our in our memories. So that, and that was a fantastic um, fantastic program. So uh, we also have had some non uh, program related uh, things that we've been doing. Um, Regina is going to send out some some links in the chat, but first, uh, at the beginning of the month, one of our staff members, Anthony, wrote up a blog post about his genealogy experiences um, and his journey through discovering more about his family history. So we encourage you to to look at that. Um, one of our other reference librarians, Heather, decided to do some research on really New Jersey's only known witch, um, and went through and did a very very nice write up about the the history of her and uh, a lot of the, the research and resources that she used to, to find out some more information about her. And uh, lastly, Heather also has graciously provided a, a video tutorial on how to use tax rateables um, to help you find information uh, relevant to, to your ancestors in in New Jersey. So uh, that is up on our YouTube channel. And as I said, uh, Regina's gonna put that in the chat. So we've done a lot of different things here at the library in honor of Manishville Family History Month. And uh, we'd like to thank you for, for joining us as we kind of close out the celebration. But as always, genealogy lives on every single day. So um, please use a lot of the resources we have to kind of help you. Um, Regina, we'll be taking your questions at the end of the program today. And in GoToWebinar, there is a Q&A feature that you can use. Um, it's a questions box. Just type your questions in there and we'll be happy to, to answer them. Uh, there is a survey that will be available at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have a chance, please fill it out. We love hearing from you and getting your feedback um, as we move forward with our programming here at the library. Um, and lastly, just to point you out for some, some more information, uh, Regina has created a genealogy research guide um, at the link on the, the screen there. Uh, it has all, everything you need to know about, <laughs> about genealogy research, um, from how to start conducting, sources to use, databases that are available. Um, all of our past genealogy-related videos and programs are linked on there, so you can find uh, some really, really great information there, so I encourage you all to look at that. So uh, that is everything that I have for you. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to Regina. Hi, everyone. Give me just one second. And I'm just getting my slideshow set up in there. And Andrew, you can see, right? Yeah, looks good. Okay, excellent. So we will get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Regina. Uh, I'm the genealogy librarian here at the State Library. Um, and today we're going to be doing a genealogy research stories class. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Genealogy Research Stories series is not an instructional series. So, you know, an instructional class on newspapers would be where I was kind of guiding you through resources and how to use them and best practices. The Genealogy Research Stories is instead a way for me to tell you some fun and interesting stories. 
I hope that the information does have a little bit of instructional value, but that's not the main focus of the series. Uh, so I just want to be completely upfront about that. However, in the Q&A portion, I am happy to provide additional instruction um, and advice to you. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about newspapers and how newspapers for me and my research have saved the day uh, a couple times. So I'm very excited to talk to you about that. Um, I'll be taking questions at the end. And uh, just to let you know, I'm anticipating this presentation to be fairly short. So we will have plenty of time at the end if you have you know, a little bit more in-depth uh, research questions. Before we begin, I am going to give one bit of instructional advice to you. I know, particularly for New Jersey, a lot of the records aren't online and people are trying to rely on things that they can find online. Um, so often, if you know somebody's blocked by getting to something because of a paywall or because something costs something, they'll say, okay, well, what's a free way that I can access or try to get at this information another way? And their first thought is to turn to a newspaper. My advice is always going to remain to you that you need to go for the records first. The records are probably going to be able to answer your questions, especially if you're looking for biographical information for a family member, a lot quicker and easier than a newspaper will. And I know that this is difficult to hear, especially right now where, you know, even if you are willing to go behind the paywall and, you know, pay for records, there's a major delay in a lot of places. I know uh, right now the New Jersey Department of Health Bureau of Vital Statistics, who has the modern birth, marriage, and death records, are in a delay. I know that the state archives is processing about who has, you know, the older New Jersey vital records, which many people are after, plus additional genealogy records at the New Jersey state level. You know, they're processing like a thousand requests at a time, and it's often taking two to three months to get the information. And I know that it's very hard to be patient. But what I will say is the records are worth waiting for. And a lot of times that's where you're going to find the family information that you want. However, I'm going to demonstrate today that in a couple that in some instances, newspapers can really, really help you clear up uh, some mysteries. So I'm not saying that, you know, you should not check newspapers or not pursue newspapers, but my advice again is always going to be go for the records first, even if they are behind a paywall, even if you have to wait a little bit of time for them, because that's probably where the information that you want really is. So with that caveat, let's talk about newspapers and let's talk about how they saved the day. And there we go. Okay, so our first story is about a lady named Marion Chester. Uh, I was contacted uh, to help find out what happened to Mrs. Chester by a family of hers up in Canada. Uh, they knew that Marion Chester uh, was living in Ottawa, Canada, and that she had moved in the 1940s to Princeton for work, and they could not find her after this. Uh, you can see on the right, the right side of the screen, two incredibly detailed uh, screenshots of uh, a passenger manifest where we can see Marion Chester uh, traveling from Ottawa, Canada to Princeton to start work. This little certificate has tons of biographical information. We get her full name, uh, including her maiden name as her middle name. 
uh, we know her birth date. We know how old she is. We know what she does for a living. Uh, we know her last known address. Uh, we know who her father is. She has emergency contact information on here for her father, William Mason, which confirms her maiden name. And we have his address where he's living in Scotland. We know who her employer is going to be in Princeton, New Jersey, and the address where uh, she's going to be living. We know uh, her physical description, and on the back of the certificate, you can see on the bottom left, uh, on the back of the certificate, that she signs her name. So we even get her signature. And we also know, <laughs> excuse me, when she's traveling, there's an interesting note on the back. Uh, we know that her employer is uh, an army lieutenant named Frederick A. Milholland, um, and he filed uh, a note at the U.S. Embassy uh, in Ottawa that gives us what her set salary is going to be. So we even know that when she gets to Princeton, she's going to be making $80 a month. So we know quite a lot about her up to this point. However, after this record on the right of your screen, she disappeared and her family was at a loss to figure out what happened to her. Did she stay in Princeton? Did she go back to Canada when she was done being employed? Did she even emigrate back to uh, Scotland? We don't know. So I started doing research on Marion Chester. And since this was the 1940s, and I started looking at the census. However, unfortunately, since the uh, 1950 census has not yet been released, we only have the 1940 census to work with. So I started researching the Milholland family. Uh, I figured, you know, if they were well to do enough to hire a servant, maybe there would be news and information about them around that I could find. And maybe somewhere in passing, I would find reference to their servants, including Marion Chester. So you can see uh, below that I have a screenshot of the 1940 census uh, with the Milholland uh, household. And I actually found quite a bit of information on this family. And I was able to pass this on initially to the researcher. Um, and she was actually able to reach out to uh, some de descendants who remembered Marion Chester via Facebook. And they were able to tell her some interesting stories. One of the most interesting things that I found out was that Frederick Milholland, and you can see on the census under his profession, it says he's an interior decorator. And his interior decorate his interior decorator firm is actually still in operation today in Princeton, New Jersey. You can even see a screenshot on it on Google Maps, but I didn't include that in the presentation today uh, since this is about Mrs. Chester and not directly about the Milholland family. So my initial strategy was to try to find Mrs. Chester through her employers. Um, and I found tons of information on them, did not find much information on her. The next thing that I checked since she was employed um, were the city directories. City directories are fantastic census substitutes, particularly if you're looking after 1940 or you're looking in between census years. They're an annual alphabetical direct directory of residents, usually by household, uh, the head of house is listed. However, sometimes if someone within the household is employed, usually you know, a, a son or another uh, male relative, um, they may have their own entry. 
Uh, so I checked that just in case, uh, but Mrs. Chester still did not appear in uh, the city directories. And I, because we were moving beyond the census and later into the 20th century, when basically you have the social security death index, um, newspapers and, and some other things, I, I really couldn't find another way in, in uh, primary documents collections uh, to find Mrs. Chester. What was, what I found interesting about this particular census uh, screenshot though, and why I included it, is you'll note that the Milholland family had uh, two servants living in their household. The first, uh, Fanny Johansson, you'll note, came from Montreal to work. The second servant, you'll note, was the cook. So I'm assuming that uh, possibly Mrs. Chester replaced uh, these, these two servants when she came to work for the Milholland family because I believe um, they're, they're somehow related, maybe possibly um, a married couple since they both have the same last name. So I, I found that interesting and I did point that out to the researchers um, as it may have been a clue as to why Mrs. Chester then uh, emigrated down to the United States to work for the Milholland family. So how did newspapers save the day in this case? So I, again, I had checked all of these records, was completely stuck, had no suggestions about how to move forward as Mrs. Chester wasn't appearing in the city directories. However, this is where newspapers help to save the day. Um, many people think that newspapers well, many people associate newspapers mostly with obituary research, but there's a lot of other useful information in newspapers. And one of the really useful things is they tend to have uh, local and community news and particularly in older organizations where these community organizations were a lot more active, there's a lot of social news um, about this. So I found an article in the Trenton Times uh, for November 21st, 1945, that has Mrs. Chester being inducted as an officer into the Daughters of Scotia. Uh, the Daughters of Scotia is a Scottish, Scottish heritage organization. Um, it's still active today. One of the things I actually suggested to the researcher was reaching out to the New Jersey state chapter or the national chapter to see if they collected any information or had an archive of chapter uh, ephemera and things of that nature to see if she could find more details about Marion Chester's participation in this particular organization. But what this article did was it established that Marion Chester was still in uh, Princeton at the end of 1945. So based on that, and based on the certificate in the first slide, where we saw that she was in her early 30s, I started to wonder, well, could she have gotten married? So on my end, what I was able to do was I was able to go on to the New Jersey Marriage Index, uh, which spans from 1901 to 2016, and it's a searchable uh, database on Ancestry. And I was able to look up Marion Chester to see if possibly she remarried. And I did find an entry for Marion Chester, uh, but I, I, 
had no context and no idea if it was her. It was just a name. It didn't say that she was from Princeton or anything like that. So I sent it on to the researcher and I said, well, this may possibly be her, but I'm not sure. And then on uh, the researchers and they actually uh, requested a naturalization search to, to see if Marion Chester naturalized as a United States citizen. And they couldn't find Marion Chester, but what they did find was Marion Goring, um, and and that was from uh, the the New Jersey Marriage Index. That was the uh, that was the groom's name. So they had the the uh, researcher also check for Marion Goring, and the biographical information in the naturalization papers confirmed that it was her, and uh, and then once. Once they had that, she was able to get the marriage information and the information from the naturalization uh, matched the information that was on that first little uh, immigration card that you saw in our first slide. So indeed, Marion Chester was in Princeton and she married a local man named Daniel Goring in 1946. So basically, that newspaper article helped us get at the, the records that, that had the biographical information that we needed to confirm Marion Chester's identity. Once we had that information, it opened the floodgates and it gave us the information what that the researcher really wanted. She wanted to know what happened to Marion Chester and if she stayed in Princeton. So what happens is once we have the correct last name, we finally start to see Marion and her husband Daniel on city directories. Uh, and we know that they lived in Princeton from 1949 through 1976. I was also able to check her and find a grave and confirm that she and her husband were lifelong New Jersey residents and that they are buried in a, uh, in a cemetery in Princeton. So they stayed in the Princeton area the rest of their lives. I was able to find both of their obituaries uh, in the Trenton Times and in Marion's case for Daniel and in Marion's case uh in the princeton packet which is a little local community newspaper and i have marion's obituary uh to the right of the screen and from her obituary of course and this is what most people think of when they think of newspapers and of course the obituaries have tons of biographical information so for instance, we know how old she was when she was when she died. We know that she was a long-term New Jersey resident from this. We know all about her career. And remember, she was she was employed as a cook for the Milholland family. But the obituary, as you can see, details her other professional exploits, including working for 15 years uh, for for Princeton High School in the cafeteria services. And she also worked as a uh, housekeeper and um, for the educational testing services, which is fascinating. Um, and in addition, we learned some family information about her, namely, this again confirms who she was married to, but also that she and her husband had a daughter. It also gives us where she was buried and uh, where her funeral was held. So this was exactly the kind of information that the researcher was looking for. So you can see how a single article can really turn us on to the record sets that we need that provide the additional biographical information. And then of course, her obituary is highly detailed and helps to wrap up the rest of her life. So that is our first genealogy research uh, 
story, I considered this a huge genealogical research triumph because until we found that one article, I was really not sure where to head from there um, and whether or not we would be able to verify any further information about this individual, Marion Chester. So here is our second story. And this involves finding the location of a cemetery. The researchers in this case uh, ordered the death certificate for a relative whose name was Rose Isaacson. She died in the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic uh, in, in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, you can see that the death certificate, again, like uh, that little uh, immigration uh, certificate we saw, has a lot of biographical information on it. And death certificates will include things like, you know, date of birth potentially, depending on what the informant knew about the person. And you can see that a lot of fields here actually say not known, probably because her husband, who was the informant, wasn't sure of certain personal details about her. Uh, it may also give you parents' names. Um, it will give you usually uh, their, their last place of residence where they were living. So uh, for instance, this uh, down on the lower right of the certificate, we can see that Rose Isaacson was living at uh, 22 Erie Street in Patterson. We know uh, the length of her illness, what she died of. Um, and then finally, what what in detail that people are usually after is down on the right side, you have the date of burial and you have the place of burial as well. And you can see that under the uh, place of burial, it says Duck Farm Cemetery. The researcher wrote to me because she couldn't find any record of a cemetery named Duck Farm Cemetery anywhere. And basically she was wondering if because you know the the rate of death during the Spanish influenza epidemic was so high that maybe the county or you know the city of Patterson maybe found a farm or something and bought some of the land or commandeered it or the farm donated it as a burial place specifically for um influenza victims because we we could not find well she couldn't find it and she reached out to me and then of course i initially couldn't find um anything so we we were at a place where we just had absolutely no clue what this cemetery was now said county where patterson is does maintain a list of cemeteries. Duck Farm isn't one of them. Find a Grave doesn't have a cemetery that's that's anything even close to something that says Duck Farm. I did some research. I think I literally Googled Duck Farm Patterson <laughs> and I found an old historic an old um, kind of remembrance uh, memorial to this organization called Abrams Duck Farm. And they would have a summer picnic there. And there was this cute little article with, with you know, pictures of people gathering at the duck farm. But the duck farm wasn't a cemetery. Nothing in the article said anything or indicated anything about uh, the duck farm being a cemetery. 
the duck farm was also not in Patterson itself. It was in a town, and I'm sorry for locals, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation because I've never been up there, uh, but Totowa, um, New Jersey, which is right adjacent to Patterson. Um, but, you know, the woman was a resident of Patterson. She died in Patterson. So I had assumed she would be buried within the city of Patterson. Um, the other possibility that I was thinking that was possibly Duck Farm Cemetery was a nickname uh, for one of the cemeteries on uh, the list. And I kind of guessed if the cemetery was in Totowa, New Jersey, um, that possibly it might be, maybe it was adjacent to this duck farm and maybe that's why it was known as duck farm or duck pond or something, cemetery. So we looked and, and you'll note on the, on the right of the screen, our, our picture, of the cemetery is of the entrance of the A.M. White Lodge Cemetery. And that is a little clue for you. So again, newspapers saved the day here. I, I had absolutely no idea where to go with this. You know, I had searched all these lists of cemeteries in Passaic County. You know, the only, the only thing that I could guess is, is Potentially, there was the stuck farm, and potentially, you know, maybe a, maybe the cemetery was right adjacent to the stuck farm. But who knew, right? Like, I, I had no way of verifying that. So I, I went to a colleague of mine, and I was like, okay, you know, I, I'm going to have to tell this lady that I, I'm striking out here. Do you have any other ideas of things to check? And uh, my colleague actually had access um, to another one of our colleagues' uh, private newspaper subscription uh, database. And so she was actually able to go on, do a search, and we found the article. She, well, she found, I did not do anything. I just came to her and was like, oh, I have no idea what else to check. Do you have any ideas before I have to write this lady and tell her that I struck out? And she found this article uh, to the right. Now you'll note that Rose Isaacson died in, um, in 1918. So this is four decades later. And again, you'll note that you can see where's my mouse at the top, that again, this is in Totowa Borough. And this is about a new proposed road route running through the town. And it has this very intriguing sentence right here. It would go west through Stein Cemetery the Duck Farm, Penny Coal Company, and Sam Brand property to Union Boulevard. And so if this is Abrams Duck Farm, there's a cemetery called Stein Cemetery right adjacent to it. So guess what? I went back to that list of Passaic County cemeteries. And guess what I found? I found a Stein Jolson Cemetery. And so immediately I was like, okay, well, I, I have to write to this lady and tell her that she needs to look into this Stein Jolson Cemetery. And you'll note that the Stein Jolson Cemetery is contained within the A.M. White Lodge Cemetery, which is why on uh, the previous slide, I have the image of the gates. So that gives you an idea of Rose Isaacson's cemetery. 
So I, I made this suggestion, you know, we were not 100% sure, but we felt it likely since Totowa was pretty close to Patterson, that there was a good possibility that Stein Cemetery or the Stein Jolson Cemetery was what she was looking. So sure enough, the patron uh, did reach out to the cemetery. They were able to look through their records and they were able to confirm that Rose Isaacson and her husband, who was the informant on her death record, were both buried there. The patron who wrote to me for assistance uh, did tons of background research and she did a lot of local research. And so she authored this fantastic blog post, which she shared um, on jewishgen.org. And she includes details that I did not have access to because she researched in depth kind of uh, the background of what was going on in Passaic County during the um, Spanish influenza epidemic, you know, how they were handling the multitude of deaths there and what they were doing about burials. Um, and she also has more in-depth information on the Stein Jolson Cemetery and uh, some more local resources. So I highly recommend checking out uh, the blog post because that it's it's a wonderful story, and I feel like uh, she she her additional details really do it more justice. But this just this story just goes to show you that you can look at a newspaper article, even decades after an event. And sometimes, depending on what you're looking for, you can find relevant information that will help get you answers. And this most certainly led us uh, to discovering the correct cemetery where this lady was buried. So that was uh, just a short little, couple short little examples of how exactly you can use newspapers to find great information. I really hope you enjoyed and had fun listening. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free um, to, to ask now. If you have any highly in-depth questions that you'd like to me to answer in greater details, my email is up there. You are absolutely free to contact me by email as well. Uh, I have the link to the blog in my slides, but Andrew is also going to post it in chat for you so that you can explore it. If anybody wants me to send them the link directly, please just send me an email and I am happy to do that. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Regina. Well, uh, let's see if we have any questions that have, have come in. Um, if anybody does have any questions uh, and you want them uh, answered on, on the program today, you can use the questions box in the dashboard, or if you would like to just reach out to Regina directly, her email address is, is on the screen there. Um, and just uh, somebody uh, sent a kind of a, a word for advice. A word of advice is that um, Veterans Day is often a day when Ancestry and others, including like full three, may offer a free day so you, you can get around their their paywalls. So just keep that in mind. Look out for those um, if you're if you're struggling with with that aspect. Uh, so the first question we have is when will the 1950 census be released? It's going to be pretty soon, I think. I think it's. What is it? It's 72 years. So, so 1950 plus 72. Is that this? Is that 2022? I'm sorry, I don't have my calculator in front of me. It might be 2022 or 2023. So it's coming soon. Unless I'm a decade off. Is my math that bad? Andrew, do you have? No, that's right. It's 2022. A calculator. Yeah. Yeah, so my my guess is it'll be sometime next year. 
were you able to scan for Mary and Chester in the 1945 newspaper, or did you read through the section on community news? Yes, so here at the State Library, we're really lucky. We have access to the historic Trenton Times uh, newspaper database, which goes from 1893 to, oh, I'm sorry, no, 1892 to 1993. Um, so all I had to do was type in her name, Marion Chester, and I probably put Princeton in there. And that's how I found uh, the articles. We do also here at the State Library, um, if, and, and by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know, right now we are open uh, for research appointments. So you can come in and you can do your research weekdays. Uh, right now our, our visiting hours are 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. I highly recommend you make a research appointment with us. When you come on site, you have access to our collections and you have access via our computers to our, our databases, uh, which include the Historic Trenton Times newspaper database. Uh, if you would, if anybody on the chat on the program would like to make a research appointment to come in, you can just send me an email. You can also email refdesk at njstatelib.org. That's our general reference email, and uh, research librarians will be happy to get you set up with an appointment. But one of the collections we also have on uh, microfilm, we have the Historic Trenton Times from 1893 um to the present uh well i i don't know how far up our microfilm goes but we have the newspaper the trenton times up to the present um i can't remember how far up it goes on microfilm but i i think it's pretty far into the 21st century um so if you are not as comfortable with computers and like microfilm we do have you do have the option of browsing and uh, scanning that way as well. So that's just an FYI. We have some sleuths in the audience that said that uh, in April 2022, the 1950 census will be available. Yay, good. Um, what are the main sources of newspapers you look up in New Jersey? Well, it depends on where your ancestor was living. That's always going to be the most likely place you're going to find them. So at the State Library, we have uh, 20 of 21 of the New Jersey counties. We have newspapers representing 20 of the 21 New Jersey counties. A lot of these are only like the most recent four months of papers. But we do have several newspapers going back into uh, the, the 20th century and some that are into the 19th century. We have a couple of papers that go back into the Revolutionary War era as well. And we have a publication called the Extracts of New Jersey, Extracts from American Newspapers Relating to New Jersey, which uh cover from 1704 to 1780 um it's a published series from the early 20th century you can also find it digitized online that is massively useful for colonial research those of you who know me know that i am obsessed slash stalking one of New Jersey's earliest governors, Jeremiah Bass, and I'm doing his family's genealogy. Uh, so I have found that publication highly, highly useful in my Bass research. So we, we have a fairly comprehensive collection. Um, and that's here at the State Library. The State Archives, who's our next door neighbor, who's also open right now for research appointments, has a nice 19th century collection of New Jersey newspapers. However, if we don't have something or the archives doesn't have a paper, it's always good to reach out to a local 
public library or local historical society because they are far more likely to have the local newspapers. So if you're researching your ancestor, you're always going to try to know, you know, where they were residing at the time an event occurred in their life that you're interested in. And then, uh, you know, you can always reach out to us. You can reach out to the archives to see what our newspapers hold the holdings are for that particular area. And then if we don't have it, I'm always going to direct you to a local public library to see if they have it for the time period that you want. Uh, the next question, you, you kind of touched on how far back in time do New Jersey newspapers go? It, and it varies from place to place. Like, for instance, in Trenton, we have, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to call it the Daily True American. It has like, in the New Jersey State Gazette, it has like five or six different titles. Um, this newspaper started out being published in Burlington in 1777. It eventually moved to Trenton, and uh, that was kind of the state of New Jersey's official newspaper. And that lasted in Trenton under several different names up until the early 1940s. So that's an example of an incredibly prolific and long-lived paper that we have access to here at the State Library, but it it varies from place to place. Um, some newspapers last for decades, others only last for a few years. So it depends. If I have a New Jersey State Library card, do I have access online to the archive newspapers? No, I'm, well, if you are, a state employee or a Thomas Edison State University student uh, or staff member, then yes, you probably do have access, remote access to our, news, our paid subscription newspaper databases. If you are a member of the public, you don't have remote access. You would need to come to the library building in person. You can always check with your local public library to see what they have access to. Some uh, local public libraries have Newsbank subscription, um, and that's really useful. And usually Newsbank news subscriptions will kind of be targeted around the more local papers. Um, those usually aren't super historic newspapers, but they'll take you back until into the late 20th century. So maybe like 1980s, 1990s. Um, so I would advise reaching out to your local public library to see what kind of newspaper subscription databases they have. And you always have the option of coming to the state library in, in person to use our newspaper databases on site. And again, if you if you want if you would like to make a research appointment, just send me an email. I'm happy to get you set up. Question is: Will there be more, more remote webinars sponsored by the New Jersey State Library? Um, uh, as the as, as the coordinator, I can say we have webinars all the time going on right now. Um, we usually have anywhere between four and six a month, um, and I'll post a, a, a link to our library calendar um, or event calendar in, in the chat. So please check out our calendar. Um, it's updated all the time with, with new things as I as I can get them scheduled, and you can always uh, check out our YouTube channel as well. Um, and I will post that in the chat too, um, because that has all of our pre-recorded webinars um, on it well. So if there's something that uh, that you missed um, that you want to look at or just kind of see what we've been doing, um, we have that as available as well for all of our past programs. We've been doing a lot of programs 
Uh, we used to have them in person, but because of the pandemic, we switched it to uh, remote, and we've been um, we've, we've been doing that. So uh, we have a a comment. Uh, the public or Plainfield Public Library has a good newspaper collection, and the staff really knows tips to help you find items. Yep, your local your local public library is usually a fantastic resource. It's, and they're more likely to know than me off the top of my head, um, you know, about what's available locally and kind of what you can expect to find in a more local paper as well. Do you have any tips on trying to search through a newspaper that might not be digitally um, reproduced or have the, the character recognition software? So if you're just looking on a roll of microfilm, it becomes imperative that you use records to try to narrow down your date range. So you don't necessarily need a birth, marriage, or death certificate, but if you can find the family on the census or if you can find them um, in city directories and you can narrow down a date, because especially if you're looking for through a daily newspaper, even a small daily newspaper, and you only know a year, that can get really, really overwhelming fast. So if you're looking for an individual and you're looking for a major life event, like a birth, marriage, or death, I'm always going to suggest that you try to hit those records first, even if you have to go behind the paywall, like we discussed, or you have to wait a few months. Um, but if you know, if you're looking to answer a specific question, you know, like, like with the Duck Farm Cemetery, like, well, what was the name of this cemetery? Um, and you, you have a general idea of when you would be looking, like, for instance, if you know that a cemetery was sold and you're not sure of the name, but you know about when the real estate transaction occurred, you could you could check it that way. But the records are valuable because they're going to provide you with concrete dates. And then once you have the concrete date, you can then look through the newspapers for details that might not have been included in the record itself. So that that's kind of my my general advice, in mo and that's why in most cases, if you don't have just a general search option, it's always better to get the records first. How do you look up people who resided in mental institutions? So that's, that can be very hard, um, especially if we're talking back in the day, there was a lot more shame and stigma than there was now. So unless somebody was committed for a, a criminal offense or, or anything like that, I would think that that, was, that would be something that uh, people's family would want to keep out of the newspaper, not include in the newspaper. For New Jersey, if a person was institutionalized in a state institution, the state archives may have records. However, you are going to have to jump through some hoops um, to get to those because of New Jersey privacy laws. There's nothing that in New Jersey privacy laws that unblocks or unseals records, they stay confidential. So I think the rule is, and please, please check with the archives first, because I don't wanna give you misinformation, but from what I remember from working there, only direct descendants of the person, and you have to be able to prove this, if they are deceased, can have access 
to their records. So you're going to have to work with uh, the head of reference over at the state archives if your uh, if your relative was institutionalized in a state facility in order to get those particular records. There may be different rules if your relative was institutionalized in a private facility or a county facility. And what you would probably need to do if it was a county facility, you might need to contact the county government um, in order to find out how to access those particular records and if the rules are the same as the state. Private institutions, who knows, you would probably, one, either have to uh, contact the institution itself if they are still in operation, or two, if you know that the institution is now defunct, you may need to reach out to a local historical society to see if their patient records are preserved. But like I said, if it's an estate facility, those records are at the state archives. Uh, person followed up 1930s and after can't find a death date for an inmate with a common name. Uh, she was in Skillman. They're just kind of they're just looking for the death date. Okay. Um, so what I would do then is I would reach out to the state archives. Uh, their email is njarchives at sos.nj.gov. And give me a second, I'll put that in the chat. Um, and just email the state archives and see how you can access the records and what kind of proof you would need to submit to get to them. I don't know that the patient records would have a date of death, but what the records might do is it might con confirm when they were there. The thing that you have access to now without the uh, without the patient records, you have access to the New Jersey Death Index, which I will also put in the chat. Um, and you can check for that person's death record. The death record will definitely have the exact date of death. And again, you would be writing to the Bureau of Vital Statistics to get it remotely. If you are in the area, however, you can make a research appointment for the state archives or you can hire a professional genealogist to go to the state archives on your behalf. They have the microfilmed copies of the death records uh, for in-person use only available up to 1960. Um, I, if you have the opportunity to go to the state archives, I highly recommend it. You get to go in, you get to look at the microfilm yourself. It's, it's easy to use. It's alphabetical within the calendar year by the person's last name. And uh, you, can, you can go through the records. You also have the advantage then if, if you communicate with the archive staff ahead of time of while you're there getting the death record, you could also potentially get copies of the patient records as well, if those are available for the years that you need. So let me put, oh, and the, um, the New Jersey Death Index is a searchable database on Ancestry if you don't have ancestry access, which you probably do through your local public library, um, they have reclaimed the records, published the index on the indexes online um, at NewJerseyDeathIndex.com. I'm trying to remember what years are missing a good chunk of the 1930s might actually be missing. And I can't remember off the top of my head. So don't get discouraged if you search the death indexes and your person doesn't come up. So that caveat. 
I'm, I'm just typing in the archives email address into chat now. Oops. Looks like Looks that right. is all the questions that we have. Okay, there we go. Yes, Virginia just posted some stuff in the chat for you all to look at. So, um, well, I'd like to then thank this opportunity to thank you, Regina, um, for presenting and kind of rounding out our National Family History Month programming. Uh, we'll be back with a flood of, of programs next next year but we have genealogy programs all throughout the year as well so please check out our, our events calendar um, you have regina's contact information so as you do your research if you think of anything please reach out to her she is a wonderful sleuth and has answered many and many of people's quandaries um, and i'd like to finally thank everybody for attending uh, we really appreciate your your continued support um, throughout the years so uh, please, we look forward to having you back and I'd like just to end by saying be safe, be well, and hopefully we see you soon.